So I've started each week by saying that this is a message. I'm getting a lot of slap back. I don't know if it's this or what, but um, if I can have, have trouble, then they'll have trouble. Um, I've said each week that this is a message series that is, that is pertinent to us right now. Still getting an awful lot of echo. Um, I don't know if this needs to be turned on, maybe, maybe whatever. Uh, now I have no echo, but that's better. I, is it loud enough out there? Okay, all right. Some series, you know, you can kind of take the principles in the series and you can sort of tuck them away. And of course, you can do that, I hope, with this series as well. But there are certain series that we need to take this to heart right now because this is happening. Uh, we are living in a transitional period in history. These have occurred all through history. I, I gave you the example in the first message where were we a Jew living in Germany up until 1932, we would have been quite safe it would have been a good place for us to live. But in 1933, when Hitler came in power, a transition occurred. Nothing was ever going to be the same. When we are in a transition period, you've got to get this. It doesn't matter if I like it, you like it. It doesn't matter at all. It just means that God has put us here at such a time as this. He's going to be faithful. He's going to equip us. But we're going to go through bumpy rides. And we are now living in a transitional period in our country, but it's also all over the world. We're living more and more in a culture that is hostile to those that love God, that love his word, that believe that everything he says in his word, every subject that he speaks on is true, it's authoritative, it's trustworthy. The culture is becoming increasingly hostile toward that. Now, when you're an authentic follower of Christ and you love God and you love his word and you believe that every subject that God speaks about in his word is absolutely accurate, it's appropriate, it's relevant. When you believe that in your heart, well, it can be very discouraging and sometimes very frustrating to live in a culture that suddenly turned hostile. We, we see the way that the culture turns things, twists things, changes meanings, overthrows ideas that, that have for long periods of time been accepted even by those that are not followers of Christ. All of a sudden, we see ourselves being pushed in a corner further and further and further back. We see the pressure to be silenced. We see the pressure to go along if you want to get along. And we can become very hostile sometimes. We, we get aggravated. We get angry. And sometimes we can get discouraged and depressed. We just feel helpless. We feel like this, this is too strong. The current is too powerful. I don't want to be hated. I don't want to be looked upon differently by people that had in the past liked me, thought fondly of me, respected me. And the pressure becomes something that we were just not sure how to deal with. For any of us here today that are feeling the pressure and we're feeling a little bit overwhelmed, maybe we're, we're bordering on getting frustrated and angry and bitter or depressed, uh, I'm going to share really quickly a couple of scriptures, three scriptures with you to encourage you, to strengthen you, to balance you inwardly, emotionally, as we go through a transition in society in which we are going to be living in an increasingly hostile culture. Start with this, Romans 12, it says, Dear friends, don't try to what? Don't try to get even. Don't try to get even. Let God take revenge. In the scriptures, the Lord says, I am the one to take revenge. And this is very important. What is he going to do? Pay them back. Pay them back. Sometimes in, in the, the cultural rulers seem to have the last word on everything. They seem to always get their way. They seem to always get away with everything. And who am I talking about cultural rulers? I'm not just talking about just the political establishment. No, in our society today, you've got the high-tech gurus that control thought. You, you've got the media. You've got social media. You've got the entertainment world. These are the cultural rulers today. And sometimes it feels like we don't have a chance. We don't have a say. But God is watching. They will someday be held to account. Let me share another one with you. It says, they will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. We've got a society today that's going after children ruthlessly without shame. They're going to be paid back for this. They're not going to get away with this. The harm that they have done, God will pay them back. And don't be thinking in your mind, yeah, he's going to roast them and toast them for, um, you know, forever. God's going to deal out justice. And I have a theory about this. Actually, I did some teaching in a Bible Institute about it in which the harm that we dish if we don't turn to Christ and receive the forgiveness of God, those that reject God 
they'll receive the harm that they have dished out to others. They'll, they'll actually experience it, in my opinion. One last one. For he has set a day when he will judge the world, and once again, with what? Justice. Justice. But here's the thing. When the culture turns hostile and the rulers of the culture seem to be always winning, always getting the last word, always pushing us further back into a corner, always silencing us more and more, always making us fearful that we're going to say the wrong thing at the wrong time in the wrong way, God is saying there's a day. He may not judge them now. We may not live to see it. But there's a day every human that's ever breathed God's good air will be held to account. Now, if we've turn to Christ and we love God and we're living according to his will and his ways and his word this will be a wonderful thing a day of reward but for those that have disregarded God they're going to be judged they're going to be held accountable God's given everybody the gift of life and we're going to be accountable to how we have used that gift of life all right so here's our series living in a hostile culture today we're going to deal with this the Lord rules the rulers because sometimes we feel like the rulers, they have complete control, that we just feel helpless and, and blown along by this current that we couldn't possibly resist. But that is not true. The Lord ultimately rules the rulers. And sometimes when things get really dark and really difficult, we have to internalize this truth. That's why God gave it to us, so that we can remind ourselves. They may appear to be ruling now, but their day is coming they, they, they have a short shelf life evil has a short shelf life it may feel like it's rained a long time but compared to eternity it's going to have a very short shelf life we're going to turn to the book of Daniel and we're going to be in Daniel 4 today now just to put you in perspective when we started in Daniel 1 we've traveled from Daniel 1 2 3 to 4 about 36 years Daniel was about 16 years old when he was taken captive you know into Babylon He's probably about a 52-year-old man now. He's going to end up staying in Babylon for 70 years. He's going to go through a series of four different rulers, and he's still there at the end. So we're in Daniel 4, and this is one of two prophetic dreams that God has given to this man called Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the ruler of Babylon. His father, Nebuchadnezzar, was ruler before him. Nebuchadnezzar was a, was a mighty field general, then becomes king uh, after his father passes. But he's given these prophetic dreams. It's an interesting thing to me. I, I'm going to be frank with you. I don't know if we might see Nebuchadnezzar in heaven. Nebuchadnezzar on three different occasions he makes these tremendous confessions that, that God is the mighty God the almighty there's nobody like him and those that trust in him you know are kept safe and he, he confesses things about God publicly to his whole kingdom that are absolutely true he sounds like somebody that's become an authentic worshiper of God but how many of you know that, that you can say all the right things about God you can know all the truths about God and you can even say them outside, out loud in public, and that doesn't mean that you like God in your heart at all, that you trust him at all, that you really want to follow him because you trust him entirely. How many of you know there's a difference between just saying things about God that are true, knowing things about God that are true, and actually trusting in the God that is true and wanting to follow him fully and freely forever? I'm serious. How many know no difference? Let me see your hands. Critical that we do, particularly in these days when a... When, uh, when, uh, sort of an emaciated presentation of the gospel is, is sort of normative today, unfortunately, in churches. All right, so we're going to dig into the story. So Nebuchadnezzar, he has this prophetic dream, and it's a weird dream, and I'll tell you a little bit about it. In the dream, he sees this great big tree, and this tree just keeps expanding and expanding until it's kind of covering the entire horizon, and all the birds and all the animals are getting their sustenance from it and everybody is dependent upon the tree and so now he calls all of his astrologers and wise men and none of them can interpret the dream and so he goes to his go-to guy Daniel who has interpreted a dream for him once before in chapter 2 by the way the dream in chapter 2 is phenomenal God gives Nebuchadnezzar a vision of succeeding kingdoms after himself all the way down to the very end of the age when Christ returns so, so this man was given a lot of privileged revelation from God. All right, so he has this weird dream. He's now going to have Daniel come and interpret this dream for him because, because in the dream also, suddenly, this big tree that's expanding, a voice from heaven, a heavenly being, has a voice that says, cut down the tree. And the tree is cut down. It says, but, but leave the roots, leave the stump, 
And after seven years, or seven times, or seven years, uh, it will be revived again. So here we go. Let's read the text. Daniel 4, 24. This is the interpretation. So now Daniel's there telling the king what the dream means. By the way, don't, don't try to interpret your dreams. <laughs> That's Bible stuff, man. That, that, they didn't have a Bible then. So God was doing a lot of things, you know. But, but we have a whole Bible. We have the whole revelation of God in Christ. So when you and I dream, it's just like, wow, that was interesting. Maybe I ate the wrong thing, whatever. All right. <laughs> this is the interpretation, your majesty. And this is the decree the Most High has issued against my Lord the King. By the way, if you read the other verses, Daniel, when he heard the dream, he was like, oh, you got to be kidding me. I don't want to be the guy to tell him what this thing means. I, and he literally says, he says, oh, my Lord the King, if only this were going to be true of your enemies and not you. So he's very concerned about the dream. You will, okay, this is the decree the Most High has issued against my Lord the King. You will be driven away from the people and will live with the wild animals. <laughs> you will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times, which means seven years. You have this again in Daniel chapter 9. Seven times will, be, will pass for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to, what does it say? Anyone he wishes. You're going to see in this passage of Scripture, Nebuchadnezzar was really feeling his oats, man. He was really feeling he was somebody special and that he had a lot coming to him, that he was superior to everybody and everything on earth. And God is literally saying, you know, I give this, these kingdoms, the, these authorities, these governing positions, I just give them to anyone that I want. First, first point God's making is, I gave this to you, Nebuchadnezzar. You didn't earn this. You didn't secure this. Now, he would have probably thought that he did. Like I say, he was a skilled field general. His father had been a king before him, but nevertheless, God's reminding him, this was, this was given to you. It was a trust handed to you. The passage goes on. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that the kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, your majesty. Now listen to Daniel. Daniel is just a guy in the kingdom. And what he is about to say to this king, this ruler of rulers, who, who his whim was you know, going to always be carried out. He says, therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your what? Renounce your sins. Remember just a, a chapter back, he was going to throw people in the fire if they didn't worship this goofy statue. I mean, the guy was just kind of a crazed egomaniac. He says, renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. It goes on. Twelve months later, so mind you, Daniel says, King, this is not good. You're going to be driven into the field like a wild animal. In other words, he's telling Nebuchadnezzar, you're going to have a mental breakdown. I'm not going to ask you how many of you have had a mental breakdown. Don't want to know. Don't want to know if you've eaten grass like an ox, like he said that he's going to. But he, he's telling him, he says, you're going to have a mental breakdown if you don't get off your high horse. God's about to humble you, he's saying. So 12 months later, he hasn't paid a bit of, a bit of attention to this interpretation. 12 months later... As the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is this not the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? That's the key verse in this. Is not this great Babylon I have built? I want to ask you a question. How many of you would, would, would think that Nebuchadnezzar never lifted one stone in place, never held a trowel, never had a hammer. How, how many would agree that? He never, he never did it. But yet he, he gives himself, the, hundreds of thousands of people probably were involved in building this thing, skilled people, hardworking people, people that weren't fairly paid. But he says, I built it. I built it all myself. Babylon that I have built, the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty what is he saying he's trying to prove something to himself that we can't but we do this all the time he is trying to prove to himself that he has significance that he has value that he has worth and he's trying to prove it by what he has accomplished what he has achieved what he can show to people when we don't have you got, some of you you got to hear this is a whole message this will be a different message for some of you when we don't have existing as a daily certainty 
a sense of worth and value simply because Christ in eternal love brought me, brought you into existence. And then he proved his sacrificial love for us by going to a cross to say, I want you so badly to come back to me, to trust me, to follow me for your own good that I will die on this cross if that's what it takes to win back your trust. That's what gives every human being worth. We are intrinsically valued because of who created us and who died for us. Unless you and I live with that governing our thought process, we will be squirrely just like Nebuchadnezzar. We'll try to build something. We'll try to achieve something. We'll try to compare ourselves favorably to others. We'll always be feeling up and down, feeling like our self-esteem is high, our self-esteem is low, and this one spoke to us poorly, so now our self-esteem is down, blaming other people. You've got to build my self-esteem up. Nonsense. Nobody can build my your self-esteem up unless that person is reminding you and I man Christ brought you into existence with a heart full of love from all eternity he purposed you to be his and he proved it in time by sacrificing sacrificing himself on a cross to you that's where we anchor our self-worth if we keep it there and we remind ourselves of that truth, we won't be trying to prove. We won't be trying to run faster, jump higher, build things, do things, uh, you know, smell right, look right, all, all those kinds of things. Not that there's anything bad about smelling right. But <laughs> anyway, even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. The one that gave the authority is now taking the authority back. So let's start by looking at a principle. Pride, pride destroys what? Sanity. sanity. You say, Randy, what are you talking about? Pride destroys sanity. I know some proud people. They're not crazy. Are you sure? <laughs> Depends on your definition of crazy, right? Depends on your definition of pride. So I put together a definition of pride. It's rather long. You may want to, some other time when you can look at it on video or online or something like that, write it down because I think it's, it's, it's valuable. Pride is living in denial of reality. It disregards God, devalues and dehumanizes people. It fills us with a false sense of superiority, invulnerability. How many of you remember days when, when you, you thought you were invulnerable? How many, how many can remember that? I can remember. I can remember my, my, my alligator mouth getting my little bumblebee butt in a, in a lot of bad <laughs> situations because I thought I was invulnerable. <laughs> I was not. I was not invulnerable. It fills us with a false sense of superiority, invulnerability, and infallibility. I'm right. I may never be, be uh, you know, always right, but I'm never wrong, that kind of thing. An entitlement to have whatever we desire. It plunges us into ever-deepening irrationality which is what I'm calling insanity. Now, when I'm using insanity today, I just, some of you might be offended already. I'm not saying anything about mental illness. Please understand me. I'm not using this in any clinical fashion. I'm using it exactly like I explained it here. It leads us into an irrational way of thinking. It's irrational to disregard the creator. It's irrational for me to devalue and ultimately dehumanize other human beings. It's irrational for me to think that I'm superior, that I'm infallible, that you know, I'm always right, uh, that I'm entitled. I'm entitled to whatever I desire. This is irrational thinking. This is what I mean by insanity. And pride does this. We feel we got it coming. We deserve it. So this is the danger, the inherent danger in pride. Here's some New Testament verses we want to look at. First of all, the King Nebuchadnezzar, his big problem to start with was misunderstood privilege. Remember the Lord says, I, I give this authority to whoever I want. Nebuchadnezzar thought he derived the authority by his own innate power, that, that he brought it to pass. He has it coming misunderstood privilege he didn't understand that God had given him a privilege he thought it was a privilege that he had won that had been achieved on his own first Corinthians 4 reminds us it says who's made you superior to others how many of you in here are really good at math you're just good at math can I see your hands okay some of you are really really scared to admit that is there, is there <laughs> how many of you are are really good when it comes to philosophical abstract kind of thinking uh, let's see your hands Nobody will admit to that one. Is there anybody? 
It's hard for me to see. But okay, there's a few. All right. Some of you, how many of you have the more uh, ha hands-on engineering minds? Anything mechanical, man, you can take it apart, put it back together. You, you, come, let me see. I engineering mind appears. Yes. Okay. Some of us are just born, just like musical talent. I, I could try to practice singing forever. It wouldn't help. It wouldn't make a bit of difference. Okay, I just was not born with that ability. We are born with different abilities, different strengths, different weaknesses. It's okay. It's, it's part of what God's intended role is for us in this life. I'll have to do my singing in heaven when I have a voice, but I'm, you know, until then. So who made you to be superior to others? We all have these different strengths we talked about. Didn't God give you everything you have? Well, then how can you boast as if what you have were not a gift? But what we will do, we will take that one area as human beings. We're so vulnerable to this, like Nebuchadnezzar, the one area that we are superior, and we will magnify it disproportionately and compare ourselves to those that don't have strength in that area because we're trying to convince ourselves that we have worth. And you can't ever succeed at that. I just want to stop for a minute and say, because I, I know this frame of mind. There's some of you, God bless you, but, but you, you're, you're just torturing yourselves. There are some of you that are endlessly prone to comparing yourself to others. You don't tell anybody. You keep it as secret as you can. Your husband or wife probably knows. Your family members know you do it, but maybe nobody else. But you compare yourself to others almost constantly. And you always try to find your a way to make yourself look a little bit better than those you're comparing yourselves to Th this is a dead-end street it, it, it's just endless torture your value once again is because christ created you and he loved you enough to die for you stick to that don't compare ourselves to one another the scripture urges us that in other places as well it leads to irrational thinking it's a dead-end street another one Deuteronomy 8, it says, you may say to yourself, Nebuchadnezzar certainly thought this way, you may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the, what? Ability to produce wealth. Nebuchadnezzar thought he had built Babylon all on his own. Look at this, this magnificent Babylon that I have built by my strength and from my might and my glory. He didn't probably lay a block in the whole process. It, it was good, hard-working individuals with great skill that did it, but he took the credit for himself. We forget that all of our abilities, and Nebuchadnezzar certainly forget, he misused his privilege because he forgot that everything that he had was really an entrustment from God. I'm hesitant to go here, but, but I will. H how, many of you, how many of you would admit you would not, I'm, I'm admitting this in advance, I, I would not make a very good God. How, how many of you would admit, I, I, if, if I were God, your life would be very different, right? <laughs> I mean, you, you know, I mean, God allows our hearts to keep beating and our brain waves to keep functioning and, you know, we, we just kind of take all these things for granted. How many of you know, if you or I were God, somebody might be waking up in the morning going, <gasps> uh-huh uh-huh you forget me if you want to and i'll take my air back from you you know <laughs> but god doesn't do that he uh he just lavishes us with gifts we take them for granted and tragically forget the giver to the the cheating of our own selves and, and this is all poor part par, poor it's all part of pride <laughs> hard for me to say so anyway Nebuchadnezzar misunderstood his privilege. Now, tuck this away because we're going we're to circle and see that this isn't totally irrelevant, um, misunderstanding our privilege for any of us. Secondly, the second thing was he misused his power. Whenever we misunderstand our privilege, we are absolutely going to misuse our power. God entrusts us with some privilege. He entrusts us with some power but if we misunderstand what the privilege is, like Nebuchadnezzar, he thought it, he earned it himself. God says, no, 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 I, I give it to anybody that I want. Well, then we misuse the power. So Nebuchadnezzar was using all of his power selfishly to get what he wanted, when he wanted, how he wanted to make himself feel good. People no longer were humans. They were objects to be used. They were pawns to be moved around so that his desires would be fulfilled. 
When, when, a society, when, a, when a society turns hostile, when a culture turns hostile, and those that rule in the society are hostile to God, hostile to his word, hostile to his will, everything becomes about them. We are, we are seeing one of the most shocking things, one of the biggest fists in the face that human beings have ever dared do to God is occurring in our lifetime. It's occurring very intensely in the past four or five years. We literally, we literally are saying, I I totally reject God who you made me to be. Now, I don't know about you. I didn't choose my height. Did you choose your height? <laughs> I didn't choose my eye color. I didn't choose who my mom was. I, 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 didn't, I, didn't, choose, I didn't choose where I was going to be born, when I was going to be born. But we as a species now have become so arrogant. The, the hostile culture, it's so hostile to God. It says, we will no longer accept anything but our own pure will and you will have no say in us you maybe made me a man but I'm not going to accept that I'm going to call myself a woman you might have made me a woman but I'm not going to accept that any longer I'm going to call myself a man we are putting the fist in the face of God as no other generation on earth ever said and in the process we are going stark raving mad we are irrational I'm not trying to be political, but when a Supreme Court justice is asked a simple question, what is a woman? And that intelligent Supreme Court justice, who is a woman, and I guarantee you she knows it, answers, I can't answer that. Well, she could answer that, but she knew that there was a political trap there, and, and that's what it's about. But culture is becoming so completely hostile toward God and his truth that we no longer, we no longer will even accept what we are, that God, he created you, if you are a woman, to be a woman. Be the woman he created you to be. He created me and other men in here to be man. Be the man he created us to be because that honors him and it ultimately blesses us. We become who we were meant to be and we're empowered ultimately to do what we're meant to do. Misuse, misunderstood privilege will produce misused power. Listen to what it says, what the powers, the cultural powers, the political powers are supposed to do for society. It says, for the Lord's sake, this is writing to Christians, for the Lord's sake, yield to the people who have authority in this world. Talking about political power. In the, at that time, Rome was in power and Nero was persecuting Christians. But he's still saying, you know, we're, we're to yield to them. In this world, the king who is the highest authority was uh, a monarchy back in, in Roman days. And the leaders who are sent by him to punish. Now, listen what the role of government and government leadership is supposed to be. Leaders are supposed to punish those who do what? Wrong. Wrong. Okay? They are not to reward those that do wrong. They are not to let them do wrong and then somehow let them escape any kind of uh, correction, okay? which is now becoming a pattern. Uh, the righteous doers in our nation more and more are those that are punished and those that clearly break the law, do evil, are rewarded. This is a complete overturn of God's intention about government. I know what some of you are thinking, but governments are terrible. Nero was persecuting Christians. He killed Paul and he killed Peter. Yes, God knows that the governments run by humans who are imperfect are going to be imperfect. But still, human government, it provides structure so that society can function. Listen, if you didn't have some kind of a structure, if you didn't have some kind of army or some kind of you know, a police force all through history, you have anarchy, you have chaos in the street, you have lawlessness run rampant. It's not safe to go in the street. You say, Randy, that sounds like what's happening right here in our country right now yeah it is it is it's becoming less and less safe to function as normal citizens in this country because we're rewarding those that do wrong and we're punishing those that do right government has turned hostile to, to God's intent for the way government's supposed to, to function and the leaders who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to do what? Praise those who do right. Those who do right are not always praised in our society today and it's becoming less and less that they are praised or rewarded. So Nebuchadnezzar, he, he misunderstood that his ruling was a privilege given by God and because he misunderstood it, he misused his power. He used people as things and just tried to make his own life as comfortable as possible. He, he wanted his own desires to be fulfilled. 
and that's what his life was all about now let me give you one example supposing that uh, you were some of this would be true I don't know who you might be but, but supposing that you were extremely wealthy there might be some extremely wealthy people here I don't know but you were extremely wealthy you let, I'll just make some stuff you, you had a I don't know a 16,000 square foot house and you had 200 acres and you had lots of people working on your land you had exotic animals and racehorses and all these different things you had two children and you know you had, you had a whole bunch of cars real fancy cars and like that and so you, you had to make a business trip for six months and so you hire someone to take care of your two children, the entire estate, your house, your cars, and all like that. And you tell them, you, tell, you give them these words. You say, okay, now we're going to be going for six months. I think I said six months, didn't I? Six months. You are in charge. You are in charge. And, and then you take them upstairs to your safe. You, you have a wall safe. And you say, okay, I want you to look in there. Go ahead, look. And there's $300,000 in cash. They're saying, now look, you're in charge. If things come up, there's the money. And, and don't worry about it. I'm going to change the, the combination on the safe. We change it weekly anyway, so don't worry about that. But for now, you're in charge. The money's there. You use it as you have need. All right? So you go away for your six-month business. Now, while you're away, this person that you put in charge, the first thing they do is they take your kids and they send them off to some weird camp so the kids are gone altogether. <laughs> They're not even there. Then you start partying. You start inviting everybody you meet. You tell everybody, it's my house and my cars. The land is mine. Uh, the money is mine. You, the first thing you do is you buy yourself a Corvette. That, that doesn't even put a dent in that $300,000. You get your Corvette. You buy all new clothes, okay? And, and you're just living high, 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 telling everybody, it's your house. It's your money. It's your cars. Everybody you see, you're telling them that. Now, at the end of six months, when you come home, you're, you're the rich people. You come home, and you see what ha, has been done. You find out, my kids have been where? They've been at some weird camp for months. You took my money, and you bought a, a Corvette. How many of you know there's going to be a serious payday? The consequences are coming, right? Are, are you, are you going to be uh, a little bit disturbed? Are you going to be angry? Why? Why? Because it was not theirs. You put them in charge but they were put in charge to handle things in a way that you would have want them handled if you had been still there. Nebuchadnezzar was put in charge by God. He was not meant to rule ruthlessly. He was not meant to rule by impulse. He was not meant to use people to fill his ego needs. He was given a privilege to lead, to guide, to shepherd, but he misused it. He was given power power to serve but instead he forced everyone and everything to serve him let's pick back up in Daniel 4 it says at the end of that time now this is the end uh, you know uh, of the seven year period at the end of that time I Nebuchadnezzar so in other words Nebuchadnezzar indeed lost his mind roamed around outside like an animal don't know if he ate grass or not but it sounds like he did must have uh, been something that he could, he could live with and so his, his seven-year period of being without his faculties has ended. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my what? My sanity was what? Restored. Restored. Listen, I can't function rationally when I exclude the greatest reality of all, the creator himself when I function either knowingly or unknowingly as though he doesn't exist or if he exists he doesn't really matter and how I behave myself doesn't matter to him then I am behaving irrationally I'm ignoring reality when I looked to heaven my sanity was restored then I praised the most high I honored and glorified him who lives forever his dominion is an eternal dominion his kingdom endures from generation to generation at that same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and, and I was restored to my throne, and I became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right, and all his ways are just. And get this, and those who walk in, what's the word? Pride. Pride. He is able to do what? Humble. Humble. 
You know, pride, pride is a funny, fragile thing. Do I have your permission to tell an old joke that you've heard me tell before, but it's one of my favorite? Permission? And, and, and if it bores you and you're, oh, Randy, we heard that thing for it. It's all, you can boo, I don't care. <laughs> so this lady goes to a dentist, new dentist. And as she's in there, she's looking at the, you know, the documents on the wall, you know, the different colleges he graduated from, and she sees high school, and it's like, whoa, Proctor High School. That was my high school. And so she's looking at the name Bobby Bradley, and she's like, Bobby Bradley? That was what this handsome guy had this big, thick hair. He was so athletic. I had a secret crush on him. I was in his, in his class with him, a lot of classes with him. I had a secret crush. <laughs> but look at, the, look at this dentist. This dentist is, he's like balding, and he's kind of frumpy, and he's all wrinkled. And she said, it can't be. It can't be the same guy. No way it's the same guy. So she kind of ratchets up her nerve, and she says uh, to the dentist, she says, did you by any chance go to Proctor High School because I, I went to Proctor High School and there was a Bobby Bradley and the dentist's eyes light up and he says yes I did go to Proctor I was a Mustang I did go to Proctor High School and she says well well I was in a class with you he says imagine that he says what class did you teach <laughs> <laughs> Pride is very fragile. It doesn't take much. Pop the, bu pop the balloon. Yeah. Okay, you didn't boo me. That's good. That's good. <laughs> I gave you a definition of pride, uh, a rather lengthy one. I'm going to give you an equally lengthy definition of humility. And frankly, if you take them, all I did was deconstruct the first one uh, because that is, that is correct. It's appropriate. Here, here we go. Humility develops sanity, first of all rationality sanity here's why here's what humility is humility is living in touch with what i'm seeing god as he is i'm seeing myself as as i am i'm seeing you as you are i'm in touch with reality humility is living in touch with reality it regards god supremely while valuing other people equally it fills us with a true sense of equality vulnerability fallibility and thankfulness for whatever we have. It leads into an ever-deepening rationality or sanity. And again, I'm not using this in a clinical sense. I'm using sanity in the sense that I, I'm looking at things as they are. I am being rational. Humility is sanity. Humility is rational. Pride is, is crazy. It's insanity. We can't even control the next brainwave. We can't control the next breath. We can't control the next heartbeat. We live presumptuously on God's grace all the time, and then we get puffed up with pride, and our existence itself could end like that. How many of you know that, that people die at all different ages, young, middle and, and old and so forth how many just agree with that you can die at any time I could die right before your eyes wouldn't that be a thing to remember I was in church last Sunday and the pastor died you, know? <laughs> you talk about it for a week and I'd be forgotten forever but that's okay the Lord remembers <laughs> so humility is beautiful first of all you n I've never seen a human being that's authentically humble and you can't fake real humility that you're not drawn to it. It, it. It's not simultaneous with that. I've never seen a hum, human being that's proud and arrogant that is not repulsive to some degree at least. And we know this on some level. So humility is, is being living in touch with reality. Let, let me go to the second part now. So Nebuchadnezzar misunderstood his privilege, okay? He, he wasn't just privileged to dominate and govern and use people for uh, his own whims he was entrusted by God to lead he was entrusted it was an entrustment it, it was it was a privilege Jesus said in Luke 12 48 he said to whom much is given much will be required first Peter 5 it says be shepherds and this is speaking most of the people like me but but it's applicable you're going to see later on in the message it's applicable to all of us be shepherds the word shepherd there it's a Greek word poimain it, it's, it's the word for pastor. It's the same word, shepherd, pastor, same thing. Be shepherds over the flock God has entrusted to you. Watch over it as God does. Don't do this because you have to, but because you want to. Don't do it out of greed, but as a, out of a desire to do what? Serve. To serve. Don't be rulers. In other words, don't be dominant over the people entrusted to you 
but be examples for the flock to follow. Sheep follow the shepherd. The shepherd gets out in front, and, and, the, and the sheep, because they trust the shepherd, they, they follow. So entrusted to lead. Nebuchadnezzar was entrusted to lead. He didn't understand that. He mis, misunderstood his privilege. So you might think, well, what has this got to do with me? Every single one of us in here, every one of us in here, we have been entrusted on some level to lead. There, there are people all throughout our lives that God puts across our pathway, and, and for whatever season it might be, we are equipped in some way to guide them a little bit and to guard them a little bit, to, to nurture them a little bit, to strengthen them, to protect them. That's shepherding. And, and every one of us, you, you can think of it with your friends, you can think of it with your family, you can think of it in your place of work. Uh, we're all so to some degree given a shepherding listen to this a shepherding entrustment by God but it is not to dominate it, it is to it is to lead and to lead primarily by being winsome by, by showing that we are competent by showing that we have the character that we want to help and bless and guide and guard we, we don't want to control there's a big difference sometimes the two can sound similar but, but there's a huge difference so Nebuchadnezzar was entrusted to lead but, but he, didn't, he didn't see that he didn't appreciate that not until the end when he was humbled and his sanity came back when he was sane he realized that God is the giver of every good and perfect gift but it was not until his pride was squelched I want to say something I'm going to get off a little bit can I get off just a little bit there are some of us likely in here that we have a governing body of pride within us. We are proud, in other words. We are arrogant. We think we run a little faster and jump a little higher and a little bit slicker, and we can kind of move people around the way we want to move them around, and we can kind of always get our way. We are proud. We are irrationally proud but we don't even know it you see that's the thing about pride it, it breeds its own insanity it desensitizes us we're, we're, not even, we're not even aware and it's a very dangerous thing and so welcome whatever brings some humility I'm usually humility if you're anything like me it comes by humiliation um, you have to go through some humiliating circumstances to experience authentic humility usually at least if you're like me so just a word that I, I think God wants some of us to, to hear today that, that we could be proud and be unaware of it because it makes us crazy and we don't see what is real. All right, let me go on. The next thing, we're empowered to serve. Nebuchadnezzar thought that, you know, he, he was just to use his power to fulfill his own desires. A lot of us unconsciously function that way. Kim um, you know, articulated earlier that, that when we are not free from the fear of death by the resurrection of Christ, when we are still living desperately, and that's what every human being does, we are driven by two impulses. We're living by self-preservation, I wanna stay alive as long as I can, and self-gratification. Now that I am alive, I wanna to try to get as much pleasure as I can, avoid as much pain as I can. These are our fundamental drives. We rarely recognize that they are the things governing our existence, but they do. But we're empowered by God not to have people serve us, not to manipulate people, not to con people, not to get our way. We are empowered by God to serve others. And you that are serving others, you that have maybe spent years and decades of serving others, you know there's nothing better in life. It, it is the most blessed experience to be able to guide and guard and nurture and comfort and, and educate and all these things that go into it, to serve other people. It, it's the most blessed gift that God gives us, but it's, we're empowered not to have others serve us, but for us to serve them. And it's the real test of what kind of interior power we have. Listen to Jesus' words. He said, whoever among you wants to be great must become the what? The servant of you all. It's the person that just wants to use their abilities, their capacities, their life learnings, their giftedness to give back to others. They show that they have the heart and mindset of God himself. He says, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life to set many others free. So 
once we understand that we're entrusted to lead and leadership is not domination we understand we're also empowered to serve it, it jesus is the model i mean god is absolutely jesus is absolutely almighty sovereign he can do whatever he wants no one in the universe can thwart his will but he does not do whatever he wants if you want to look at it from that angle his love i mean his almighty power is always governed by his sacrificial love therefore he's rational he's sane he's easy to understand he's trustworthy he's winsome he's beautiful he's wonderful it's because he is the almighty one but he's the almighty one whose power is always governed by his sacrificial love and that's why he's the safest person in the universe Whoever wants to be great must become the servant of you all. This is God just kind of revealing his heart to us. Just as the Son of Man has not come to be served but to serve and to give his life uh, to set many others free. One other verse in 1 Peter. 1 Peter 4 says, God has given each of you, if you're a follower of Christ, each of us, a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to do what? Serve Serve one another. Occasionally you hear people pontificate about some spiritual gift they have, and usually when they pontificate about it, they don't really have the gift they think they have. But the acid test of a genuine spiritual gift and a heart to use it is you're trying to discover that gift that God's given you, and then you're trying to develop that gift, and then you're trying to find ways to deploy it to serve others. The gift is useless if, if it's not serving others because that is the very reason that God gives power, authority, abilities, and, and even the spiritual gifts. All right, let me go to the next slide if I could. First Peter 5 gives us one last thing to pause. Now, we have fixated our attention on King Nebuchadnezzar, his misuse of his, you know, uh, misunderstanding of his privilege and misuse of his power. But this verse or this portion of Scripture brings it all back to us. And I said at the beginning of the message that, that there's a part of application that's critical for each and every one of us. God does what to the proud he resists the proud he, he, he's not going to feed into their insanity he resists the proud but he shows favor to who man if you and I stay teachable if we stay willing to follow if we stay willing to learn if we just stay broken and sane before God he's God I'm not He's infinite, I'm finite. He's infallible, I'm fallible. He's invulnerable, I'm vulnerable. He is independent, I am utterly dependent. I need him, he doesn't need me, but he does love me. If I stay there, if I stay humble, then God's gonna favor me. He knows I'm one that he can lead, he can teach, he can develop, he can, he can then entrust to be a blessing to others. It goes on to say this, it says, humble yourselves then, this is something we can do. Humble yourselves down under God's mighty hand so that he will lift you up when? In his own good time. You see, there, there, there's a time that if God were to elevate our influence, if we don't have the character development to sustain the giftedness, it will collapse. We will misuse the power. We will not lead well. We will not serve well. There has to be the development of hu- humility so that our character is sufficient to carry the task, the opportunities, the open doors that God gives to us. Until we are humble, we can't even grow at all as human beings to become the person that God always intended us to be, the Christ like version of ourselves. But once we start to humble ourselves and we let God work in us deeply, deeply in us, and start to, you know, kind of open all those doors that we try to keep closed, well, then he sees, I I can trust this person now. I I can elevate their authority, if you want to use that term. I can elevate their influence is a better term because they will use it unselfishly. They don't need anything back anymore. They're they're, they're not playing games with their own ego. They're not to prove anything. They're not trying to prove anything themselves. They've got my heart. They've got my mind. They just want to give. So I'm going to close with two questions. Here we go. Which outlook is ruling in you now? Which is governing the most? Outlook number one, the ruler's rule. Our culture, the the hostile culture, it's ruled by those that are in the political power and those that are in the media and those that are in the entertainment world and those that are in the sports world and social media. We feel just ruled and overwhelmed. If you feel ruled and overwhelmed, here's what's going to tend to grow. You're going to feel increasing frustration 
You're going to feel hopelessness and discouragement. I'm going to add one more in there that's not there. You're going to be dangerously close to becoming bitter, and you're going to get a little crazy, okay? So be careful. If you feel, Daniel never felt overwhelmed. He, he didn't have that attitude, the ruler's rule. He always saw God first and the ruler's through that he speaks to Nebuchadnezzar stop your sinning man stop oppressing people maybe God will give you a little bit more time he never was intimidated he was respectful he was he was appropriate but he never was intimidated he never was frustrated be careful if this is ruling in you and you're angry every day every time you see something on the news you're angrier and angrier be careful because because anger and bitterness and frustration and hostility never achieve the work and will of God maybe this is more your mindset the Lord rules the ruler and you can tell if this is your mindset because you will have increasing peace you will have hope even though we're in a transition period where things are not going to get better they are going to get worse and you will have courage that's most important you will have courage to know that the God that created all things he put me here at this time this place he knows exactly what we're going to face he knows who I am what my strengths what my weaknesses are but he will see to it that he will faithfully equip me to do whatever needs to be done that I can honestly and accurately represent him until my last breath and my security is in him and in what's to come one last picture for you if you had to put yourself in this little drawing here I want you to consider God has given to each of us some privileges he's put us in some positions where we can exert some influence am I most likely am, have I understood the privileges that God's given me and what it's calling me to do have I understood that the privilege that he's given me, he's entrusted me to lead. I'm supposed to be guarding. I'm supposed to be guiding. I'm supposed to be nurturing. Look at your roles, relationships, and responsibilities. We all have them. And ask yourself, which, of the, which side of this equation are you falling on? Misuse power. If we misunderstand our privilege, we're going to misuse our power. We're entrusted to lead, but we're empowered to serve. Am I serving? Am I serving those that I've been given the position to lead. Look again, look at your, we all have them. We all have roles, relationships, responsibilities. So Nebuchadnezzar's lesson is not just Nebuchadnezzar's lesson, it's my lesson. I've got to learn this. We need to learn this. And we would do well to just kind of patiently let God sort of search us out. How are we doing in this particular realm? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are the God that interacts in real human history. You, you preserve the record for us. There's no one like you. There's no one so sacrificial, no one so good, no one so trustworthy. Thank you that you entrust so much to we frail and imperfect humans. May your spirit give light to each of us that we can assess our roles, relationships, and responsibilities and see where it is that you've entrusted us to lead and empowered us to serve. We ask that you might help us with this, Father. We ask it all in Christ's holy name. Amen.